Eight SAS men dropped behind enemy lines during the Gulf War, just a decade ago. Within days, three of the soldiers were dead, four were captured, and one walked across the desert to freedom, one of the great epic journeys of British military history. Bravo 2-0 is the most famous military incident of recent history, and a story known to millions through books written by two of the soldiers under their pseudonyms, Andy McNabb and Chris Ryan. Here were some real life heroes, contemporary British heroes, their very names conjuring up images of gritty courage in the face of overwhelming odds. They were just eight, but after they returned, the patrol commander, Andy McNabb, said they'd killed or injured 250 Iraqis, an extraordinary feat of military expertise. But now it's just over 10 years later, and there's one final story still to tell, the one left behind in the Iraqi desert. Just after 9 p.m., January the 22nd, 1991, an RAF helicopter dropped eight SAS men over 180 miles behind enemy lines. Their mission, to locate Iraqi missile launchers. Michael Asher is Britain's leading desert explorer and a former trooper in the SAS himself. He's returned to Iraq to rerun the fateful patrol undertaken by Bravo 20. Over the years, he's crossed around 20,000 miles of desert, and now he wants to find out what they went through. I'm in the desert of Iraq, in the very place where Bravo 20 was inserted by helicopter on the 22nd of January 1991. And it was for them, the big mission of their lives. I mean, it was really the big one. This was the thing they'd been training all their lives for. You know, they, here they were on a major operation in a major war, 180 odd miles behind enemy lines. And this place looks pretty sinister to me, but how much more hostile must it have seemed to them? In his book, the patrol commander, Andy McNabb, recounts how the RAF helicopter dropped them 20 kilometers from their destination, each man carrying over 200 pounds of equipment. Michael Asher sets off on the same route, with the same crippling weight in water. After a mile, he's already in trouble. It's really difficult to talk. I mean, it's such a strain. It's painful, really, really painful. <laughs> it's like a kind of torture, you know? it really is. You know? I mean, I've been getting slower and slower over the you know, distance of one kilometre, almost slowed down to a standstill, and that's about the limit of my strength for now. It's like carrying a 15-stone man on your back. The only thing for is I'm going to have to empty out the water. I mean, that's the only way I'm ever going to make the 20 kilometres. Before he left for Iraq, Michael went to the Brecon Beacons, where the SAS trained, to prepare for his trip. There's always been talk in SAS circles that the books contain exaggerations, that some of the incidents never happened at all. When Andy McNabb and Chris Ryan came back from Iraq, there was an official regimental debrief, and there are glaring discrepancies between what they wrote in their books and what they said to their SAS comrades in private. The other surviving members of the patrol can't speak because they're bound by an MOD confidentiality agreement, but the SAS regimental sergeant major at the time, Peter Ratcliffe, has deep reservations about McNabb and Ryan's claims. Was there any discrepancy between what they wrote in the books and what they actually said at the debriefings? Um, on the debriefing, they made no mention of killing 250 or wounding 250 Iraqi soldiers. But there are other casualties too. Before he left for Iraq, Michael visits the family of Sergeant Vince Phillips, one of the soldiers who died. 
which both authors, but especially Chris Ryan, blame Vince Phillips for much that went wrong. Oh, Mr. Phillips. Jeff yeah, Phillips. Yeah. I'm Michael Asher. Vince's father and both his brothers served in the army. For Vince to be portrayed as a twitchy incompetent who brought down the patrol has been humiliating for them. It seemed all the blame was put onto him, amongst you know loads of other things that were brought up, you know about him being nervous and twitchy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I should think every man in that patrol was nervous and twitchy. Yeah. He was not twitchy. He was a bloody good soldier. Michael Asher's investigation starts in Baghdad, where he plans his trip. Using the books and maps, he's identified the key places to visit as he recreates the Bravo 2-0 mission. Two Iraqi government officials will travel with him, but he's free to go wherever he likes and speak to whoever he chooses. For the last 50 years, when fighting in the desert, the SAS has always used heavily armed Land Rovers, nicknamed Pinkies. Against the advice of their commanding officer, Bravo 2-0 defied tradition and went on foot, despite the enormous weight they had to carry. It was a decision with terrible consequences. I think if I hadn't followed in the footsteps of Bravo 2-0, I'd never have understood exactly, you know, the logic of their movements. I'm doing it because I think that only by, you know, traveling under the same conditions, can you possibly get a glimpse of what it was like for those people? January 1991. Iraq starts firing Scud missiles at Israel. Bravo 2-0's mission, locate the missile launchers as they travel along this road so they can be destroyed. Watching and reporting back is a classic SAS task. To do this, they found a lying up place, or LUP, close to the road here from where they can see, but not be seen themselves. Having walked through the night, Michael Asher now tries to find the LUP. This seems to fit the ground exactly. I mean, both Ryan and McNabb describe seeing a building, some trees, a water tower within about 1,500 metres of the uh, LUP, the lying up place. 0.03 of a kilometre, and this is really looking good now. I'm sure this is it. 0 0.2. <coughs> 0 0.1. Bingo, this is it. This is the point. On there, Magellan, look. This is it. This is the LUP, and it corresponds exactly to the description, it couldn't be more perfect. There's a sort of a, an overhang, a cave, big enough for quite a few people to hide in. There's a rock in the middle, and then there's another space on the other side. This is Bravo 2-0's lying up place. I've found it, it's fantastic. Really, this is where they were. This is where, you know, this is a historical place. This is where they came. I really feel fantastic now, you know? That's great. <coughs> no, it says here, we moved all the equipment into the LUP. The cave was divided by a large rock, so we centralized the equipment, which I imagine would have meant they put it here, behind the rock. And there's a nice little cache area here underneath the rock. So we centralized the equipment, and had the two gangs on either side. So by the two gangs, he means the two half patrol. Vince's patrol was on this side of the rock, and McNabb's patrol was on this side of the rock. But the really exciting thing that this is, without any shadow of a doubt, this is Bravo 2-0's LUP. And I'm standing in the very spot that Andy McNabb and his team sat and where they spent their first night here right here. Michael Asher's next move is to look for witnesses. He wants to talk to any locals who may remember something about Bravo 2-0. The obvious place to start is the building that both McNabb and Ryan mention in their books. 
This remote part of Iraq is mainly populated by Bedouin. It's a culture Michael Asher knows well, having spent three years living with a Bedouin tribe. It soon becomes very clear to Michael Asher that this Bedouin family know a lot about Bravo 2-0. In Ryan's book, he says things first started to go wrong when a local shepherd boy spotted Vince Phillips in the LUP. Michael discovers that this family know this shepherd boy. They said that there was a boy called Adel, who was about 10 years old, about the same age as this boy. Uh, but he, he went down to the wadi, but he didn't see them, he said. He didn't see them at all, you know. Ryan, in his account, makes out that Vince moved and the boy saw him, and this is what compromised the patrol. And of course, everything that went wrong with the patrol started from that point. But according to Abbas here, the boy didn't see them at all. Abbas takes Michael Asher to meet Adel, the shepherd boy, immortalized by both McNabb and Ryan as the person who first spotted the SAS patrol and brought about their downfall. He's now a young man in his early 20s, and according to Abbas, he is the only boy in the area who looked after sheep at that time. well, I mean, I think one thing this has brought out is that the Vince is totally vindicated, you know? I mean, you know, clearly nobody's reported seeing any strangers in the wadi. I think what was really responsible for the compromise was the fact they would drop so near to this house, the house where these people live. The other interesting thing about the Bedouin's account is that they claim to have heard the helicopter land. They then take Michael Asher to the spot, just a short distance from their house. What they said was that the helicopter landed just down here. So that must be about, ooh, 300 meters away. And if what they say is true, then obviously McNabb's claim that the drop-off point was 20 kilometers to the south is rubbish. You know, they, they landed here in the helicopter and they carried their, uh, all their gear, heavy though it was, only two kilometers to the LUP. The patrol's first firefight with the Iraqis began with the arrival of a bulldozer in the wadi where they were hiding. Michael has found it. It belongs to Abbas. This is incredible. This is, this is really the bulldozer that, uh, that McNabb and Ryan both describe in their books. Abbas says he went to put the bulldozer in the wadi to park it out of the wind as he did not want the fuel to freeze. He saw the first man behind that rock over there, just saw his eyes. Um, and then he duck, ducked down again. And then when he was going back, he saw another one up there and again just saw his eyes, you know? So he saw two people. And he said at this stage he didn't know who they were. Unsure of quite who he'd seen, Abbas says he did not contact the Iraqi authorities. Instead, he told his father and brother. They all returned to the wadi, this time armed with two Kalashnikovs and an antique bolt-action rifle. McNabb and Ryan both described their first contact with the enemy as a bloody and dramatic firefight. McNabb says they were attacked by armored personnel carriers. They charged, their weapons blazing. They threw grenades and left the battlefield strewn with dozens of Iraqi soldiers, dead and wounded. 
Abbas and his brother Hayin have a very different version of events. The patrol was passing under that ridge over there with the sort of nipple on top. Okay? At that point, these two guys and their father fired two shots over their heads. Immediately, the patrol scattered, they went to ground, they started crawling into position, and they returned fire. And the bullets hit this ridge behind us here. Both uh, the SS patrol and the Arabs were firing at each other. The SS fired a smoke grenade, and it created a big pall of smoke, and under the cover of the smoke, the SS patrol made off over the, that ridge right in front of us, okay? What McNabb wrote was from this point here, they actually charged, but not, it wasn't three men that they charged, but this horde of enemies with armoured personnel carriers that were coming towards them across this ground, you know? And uh, they did this kind of charge of the light brigade, firing their 203 grenades. You know, they destroyed one of the APCs, they threw a grenade into the back of another one, it exploded. And McNabb gives the impression there were hundreds of bodies writhing all over the place. It was absolute carnage, you know? But this is a very, very different tale we're getting here, you know? Something much, much more simple, much more prosaic. Three ordinary guys who lived in that house there that you can even see from here. Just local people, this is their back garden, you know? And uh, there they were. That's, you know, if, if what they're saying is true, that was the only enemy they were up against. And this is pretty sobering, I have to say. Well, I, I just can't believe it. I'm reluctant to uh, admit it at the moment. You know, I'd have to... I'd take more, a bit more convincing than this. You know. What I want to know is this, you know. I mean, we're told in their books that they dropped their Bergens at this point. Now, I want to know if these guys found the Bergens and where they were. And I'm going to ask them about that now. And in <coughs> they say that this is the point in which they found the first Bergen. So, in fact, the Bergens they found in two groups one group of three, one group of five, which is on the other side of the hill. But this was where they found the first lot of Bergen. And they describe very, very well how they fought this tactical withdrawal, one man at a time, being covered by you know, somebody else, and I can't see how they could got, have got that from anyone else. I mean, it was absolutely right, you know, but that's exactly how the SS would withdraw. Michael is now in a quandary. Was there a pitched battle with dozens of dead, or was this just a minor skirmish? He needs to know what proof the Bedouin have got. Back at the house, the locals produce some of the stuff the SAS left behind. Same with this one. This is a standard British Army jerry can, and this is a British Army shovel. This is not the original handle, of course, they, they put this on. And this is the lid of a claymore mine. And we know from the book that they actually did leave two live mines at the LUP. And these are not used by the Iraqi army at all, but they are standard issue for the SAS. Well, we've got hard evidence. Obviously, you know, they were here. There can't be any doubt whatsoever about that. And that these people, you know, had some contact with them. Now convinced, Michael chews over some of the details with Abbas. I know one uh, tradition of the Bedou is that when somebody shoots uh, in, in the uh, sky over their heads, what they would do is wave their shamaks, you know? Uh, and Abbas says that's true. That's what the, the usual response would be amongst the Bedou. And I think it's a great, great irony that if they'd had somebody amongst the SAS who'd spoken even a little bit of Arabic and had understood the Bedouin traditions, then this thing needn't have happened at all. You know, they, if they shouted out, we're friends, you know, we're, uh, you know, stop shooting, these guys would have probably just let them go. Bravo 2-0 were very unlucky. I spent many hours talking to Abbas and eventually I discovered that he'd actually been a sergeant major in the Iraqi equivalent of the SAS. He'd served throughout the eight years of the Iran-Iraq conflict in the front line, which was real hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And amazingly, that meant that he had more combat experience than the entire strength of Bravo 2-0 put together.
Michael Asher is intrigued to know what Abbas thinks of the British soldiers. And he says that they were really brave men, they, did, they really did their duty, you know. But he said, whoever sent them here was lacking in brain power because it was really ridiculous to send people to a place like this where you couldn't survive, you know, that they knew nothing about. It was a job which was going to be uh, doomed for them. As far as Abbas was concerned, the SAS men were heroes sent on an impossible mission. As Michael Asher follows the route taken by the escaping men, there is another mystery to resolve. When an SAS patrol is deployed, there is an escape and evasion plan if things go wrong, which should be agreed by everyone beforehand. According to Ryan, the official plan for Bravo 20 was to go south, back to Saudi Arabia, an escape route used successfully by other SAS patrols. But Ryan also says that even before they left, the patrol had discussed going west. Unfortunately, they had failed to make this clear. As patrol leader, McNabb was ultimately responsible for this decision. This was the most important decision Andy McNabb would ever have to face. And he decided to head for the Syrian border. What made this decision so extraordinary was the fact that their radios had not worked since the patrol had been dropped by helicopter the night before. Back at base, no one knew of the change of plan. So while the patrol was going north and west, the helicopters were looking for them in the south. Bravo 20 were now well and truly on their own. And what was worse, the dangers of the desert had been underestimated. For although it was desert, it was winter. Already, by the second evening, the tough environment is taking its toll on Michael Asher, just as it did for Bravo 20, just over 10 years ago. See, what occurs to me as I walk along is that this is much less a, a military story than a story of the power of the landscape. And uh, I think Bravo 20 themselves, you know, as that night went on, must have realized that the, the desert itself was at least as much an enemy as the Iraqis who were chasing them. The SAS prides itself on its meticulous planning, but Bravo 20 set off into one of the coldest places on Earth without any proper cold weather clothing at all. And uh, not surprisingly, they soon began to freeze, and as they did so, they got confused. In the darkness, the patrol split up, and the two parts never found each other again. Michael prepares to spend the night alone, now following the route taken by McNabb and his four companions, Dinger, Coburn, Concilio, and Legs Lane. They built some kind of wind shelter against the, the bitter wind. They had no sleeping bags, they had no tent. They were wearing SAS smocks, like this one, dated 1942. So they had nothing special to sort of keep the, the wind off. And there was a massive wind chill factor here. You know, it was probably minus 10, minus 20 degrees centigrade. And of course, there were five of them. They cuddled together deliberately to share their body warmth. Bravo to Zero went to Iraq in the winter, Michael in the spring, but it was still bitterly cold at night. I really am beginning to feel quite cold. And, uh, you know, although it's absolutely nothing like Bravo to Zero must have felt, at least it does give me, you know, a slight, uh, slight um, indication of what it must have been like for them. I mean, they just stood no chance from the beginning. No chance whatsoever. The early morning sun brings relief for Michael Asher. But back in the January winter of 1991, Bravo 20 had no such luck. It was freezing cold and by now they were exhausted and soaked through. It was raining, snowing. They must have been in a pretty battered and dejected state. The SAS tradition is always to avoid roads and tracks, but McNabb ignored standard operating procedures. He and the four others hijacked a taxi and set off for the border. 
Abbas, the Bedouin who first spotted the patrol, has agreed to act as Michael Asher's guide, and they're now traveling together towards the Syrian border in the very taxi hijacked by the SAS. Abbas and I struck up quite a close friendship. I lived with the Bedouin. I really like the Bedouin. I understand their ways to some extent. And, um, you know, we really stuck up a friend. Also, he's a very, very nice guy, a very genuine guy. And as he said to me, amongst the Bedouin, it's really considered a, a, a disgrace to lie. Ali Ababa is no good. Well, lie. Yeah. So this is the place uh, where McNabb and his patrol claimed to have killed three people. This was the end of the taxi ride for them. And, uh, well, it was the, the last part of their journey, which ended in the capture of three of them and the death of two. Michael Asher and Abbas are on their way to meet another witness, a policeman who's told Abbas that he was at the vehicle checkpoint that very night. In McNabb's book, he tells how the patrol shot dead three Iraqis at this checkpoint. Well, this is great. Um, Abbas is saying that uh, this soldier, whose name is Ahmed, uh, was here ten years ago when the Bravo 2, uh, Bra Bravo 2 Zero patrol were here, and he knows everything about what happened that night. And uh, he's prepared to tell me about it. McNabb says that the car stopped in a queue of cars and they could see a guard with a rifle over his shoulder coming towards them. And this is what he wrote. He did one tap on the window. I put my head right back and in the same motion pushed my legs out and pressed my body against the seat. The squaddy's face was pressed expectantly against the window. Legs lifted the barrel. One round was all it took. There was an explosion of shattered glass and the car doors flew open. We were out and running before the body had even hit the ground. That's the way McNabb described it. And he describes how, once they were out of the car, they shot two other squaddies, boom, boom, all right? And then ran off into the desert. Yeah, and I'm now gonna translate that to, my, uh, to Ahmed and see what his uh, reaction is. Ahmed, Jenny. Michael Asher's lengthy translation of Andy McNabb's brutal prose prompts a curt response. He said he's absolutely 100%, he said a million percent certain that not one Iraqi policeman was hurt or killed, okay? Not one. He's absolutely said not even a scratch. Ahmed tells Michael that the British soldiers were spotted by this bridge. It was dusk. He went to fetch reinforcements. Twenty-five armed police returned and went straight into a gun battle with the SAS men. It was quite a severe firefight, a lot of bullets uh, going off, and it lasted, he reckons, about ten minutes. And they closed in on the dislocation in a sort of pincer movement. When they arrived there, they found there was nobody there at all, they're gone, they somehow slipped through the net. There is one thing Ahmed and Andy McNabb would agree on. This was the end of the line for the SAS man. In the darkness, there were more gunshots. Now, just a few miles from the Syrian border and safety, Bravo 2-0 were running for their lives. And on their heels were the police and some locals who joined them. The first to die was Bob Concilio, here in this field. But this is Mr. Subhi, and he, would, he was actually present here the day Bob Concilio was killed. And he was actually one of seven people who were over there in this building and in the trees. And he was actually present at the time he was killed. Oh, no. uh, what happened was they shouted out to him, uh, he answered in kind of a weak voice, like somebody who was really suffering from the cold or was in pain, something like this. You know, they weren't sure of uh, what he was going to do, so they opened fire on him. And uh, they reckon he was injured in the mouth here as he came down this, uh, this track here. And when he got to about here, he was hit by a bullet which somehow uh, exploded or set light to a phosphorus grenade that was in his uh, chest pocket, probably.
Bob Concilio's death was quickly followed by the capture here of Mark Coburn. He was already wounded. Ahmed's telling me he was actually in the stitch with his police unit when Mark Coburn came across this tomato field. And he was actually crawling. Can Zahaf, yeah? Zahaf, ala batna. Ala batna. Zahaf. Wa kan shayl bundagiya or? No, no. Kan shayl. Eyo. Shayl harba. Belai. Eyo. He was crawling on his belly across the tomato field, and he wasn't carrying a rifle. He was carrying a bayonet in his hand. There were six or seven of them, and they opened fire on him. They shot him, and he went down. He screamed out something in English, but he didn't know what it was. And they went towards him out of the ditch. They found he was really shivering from the cold. You know, he was really cold, and the blood was pouring out of his leg. Uh, but he was still conscious. And Ahmed himself picked Coburn up and carried him into Bewahad again. Uh, into it. He, he and another, uh, another guy carried uh, the body, you know, still alive, of course, across the field, put him in the back of a land cruiser. Ahmed brought him a blanket, covered him over, because he was really, obviously, very affected from the, uh, the cold. And he said thank you in English uh, to Ahmed. He said that from here, they took him to the hospital, and the doctor said he needed blood. He'd lost a lot of blood, and Ahmed himself volunteered to give him blood. And he had a blood test and found it was the wrong group. But one of the police uh, officers with Ahmed actually gave him blood, and, uh, of course, saved his life. Meanwhile, two other members of the patrol, Dinger and Legs Lane, had made it to the banks of the Euphrates River. In the freezing darkness, they made the fatal decision to swim. Michael crosses the river to a small inhabited island where Legs Lane and Dinger took refuge in this pump house. But by the morning, Legs Lane had advanced hypothermia and was dying. There's an old man here who found them, one of the guys who found them. He's saying the first one they found in the pump house over there was really badly affected by the cold. He was so bad that he couldn't talk, he couldn't move. And they carried him, they put him on a tractor, they took him across the water to um, the shore, and then put him in a car and took him off to the hospital. And uh, maybe, we don't know, maybe he died on the way to the hospital or, or in the hospital itself. But anyway, they're very sure that he was still alive when he left their custody. Michael Asher goes on to ask about the capture of Dinga. In his book, McNabb describes a brutal beating and claims that one man tried to cut off Dinga's ear. <laughs> He said that nobody had any reason to hit him. He said he didn't put up a fight, he just surrendered. They just searched him, they found grenades on him, they took them away, and they took him off to the police headquarters, just walking normally, they said, you know. He didn't uh, put up any fight, they had no reason to beat him. Well, it was pretty futile to swim across the river, if you think of it. I mean, all they did was come to a, an inhabited island, which the next morning was going to be crawling with farmers. I mean, they just had no chance. What were we going to do? Shoot everybody? I mean, it was pretty much, again, you know, a waste of a life. By now, two men were dead and two had been captured. That just left patrol leader Andy McNabb on his own, hiding in a culvert here in this field. McNabb says he was spotted by an old goat herder, and Michael has found the very man who's lived here all his life. McNabb says his capture was brutal, but this shepherd has a very different story to tell. He says they gave him tea. He said he's absolutely certain, 100%, that nobody punched him, nobody kicked him, nobody treated him badly at all. He said all that happened was his hands were tied behind his back, he was made to kneel down like this, okay? And he said, I asked him, well, how was it possible for them for him to drink tea? And he told me that they, they poured the tea into his mouth, you know? And he said, at first, he, he tried to back away, thought it was poisoned or something. Uh, but somebody tasted the tea for him, and uh, eventually he sort of relaxed and drank it. 
Michael does not doubt that McNabb was physically beaten once in jail. But as he prepares to follow in the footsteps of the three remaining patrol, he finds that what admiration he had for McNabb has now evaporated. Well, I think we like heroes. I think we need heroes in this country. But I don't think that our search for heroes should obscure the truth. To me, knowing the truth is much more important than creating some myth out of our need to hero worship. After the split, Ryan describes how he, Stan and Vince spent a desperate day huddled together in a small dugout. As night approached, they set off north. All were crippled by the freezing cold. But remembering the promise he made to the family back in Britain, Michael Asher still wants to try to piece together what then happened to Vince Phillips. Accompanied by Abbas, Michael Asher has tracked down this man, Mohammed, who takes him to the spot where the three SAS men spent their first day after the split. It used to be a hole in the ground, but now has been covered up. He says he knows this is the place they spent the day because he found their footmarks. Their tracks were very distinctive. They couldn't have been made by any Arab or anybody living, living in this area. I mean, they really stood out, you know? They were quite distinct. Mohammed also tells Michael that he was the man who found Vince Phillips' body. Michael checks out his story by showing him some pictures to see if he can pick him out. Yeah, there's three of the patrol here, so I'll see if he's, he, which one he picks out. And he's looking to me, Mohammed. He's one of the men who has been looking for him. Who is this? Who is this? Well, he pointed out the picture of Phillips and uh, he said he's absolutely 100% certain that this is the man he found here. Oh, he came over to him and he found the body was just lying on the ground, um, not curled up in a fetal position. His face was uh, uppermost and he had belts across his body. He was wearing a camouflage jacket. Um, he said he was a very tall man, quite a good-looking man. He had a moustache curling down beside his mouth, um, and he was wearing a, uh, a gutra or shamag like this one, but, but, taut, uh, but longer, with the ends <coughs> tied across his body and round his back. And he found, he, he searched the body, he found in it a wallet uh, with $70 in it. And there was also a photograph of his wife and two children. He says that he does have a pair of binoculars that he found in the pocket, a very small binoculars, okay? And he took those home with him, he has them at home, and he's, he, he'll be able to show me them. These are the actual binoculars he found in uh, Vince Phillips's pocket. His own binoculars. So this gives me a sort of direct feeling of connection, you know, with Vince Phillips. By the time Vince collapsed, all three SAS men were in very poor condition, suffering from exposure and hypothermia. Ryan himself says his memory of what happened is hazy and his mind was clouded. But they lost Vince late that evening. They looked for him, couldn't find him, so they left him behind. It was a terrible decision, but there was no alternative. Mohammed is able to confirm only some of Ryan's account. According to Mohammed, there were no tracks coming back towards the body. And he actually followed the tracks with five other people as far as the railway line, 15 kilometers from here. And he followed the tracks at least 15 kilometers to the railway line. And he's absolutely certain there were no tracks coming back. In the appalling conditions, Ryan and Stan had probably become disorientated and failed to find their way back to Vince. Michael Asher presses on, along the route taken by Ryan and Stan. Ryan Wright
writes that he and Stan became separated when Stan went off with an apparently friendly shepherd to find food and transport. He never returned. Ryan, of course, didn't witness Stan's capture, but this man, Al Had Abdullah, says he saw it all. Uh, what happened was they arrived here, about 15 uh, policemen and soldiers arrived here. When the man saw them, he ran off and hid behind some stones over here. Uh, they surrounded him, they moved in on him, he just gave himself up. He handed his, uh, his rifle over to the policeman, he didn't say anything, he didn't try to shoot anybody, he didn't make any trouble at all. According to Ryan, when Stan, before Stan was captured, he actually shot three people whom he says were running out of this house, three uh, policemen or jundis. And I'm going to ask the Haji now whether that's true. يعني صحيح هذا الرجل قتل ثلاثة من الجيش لما جاء هنا غير غير صحيح أيوة أبدا أيوة يعني he said it's completely untrue it's not true at all anyway they took him off there was no trouble he didn't put up any kind of a fight Nab claims that in the course of the events of Bravo 2 Zero, the patrol killed 250 people. Well, I've covered almost all of that ground. I mean, I haven't quite finished Ryan's journey, but I've covered a lot of that ground, and I haven't discovered a single person that they killed. And as far as I'm concerned, up to now, you know, far from being 250, the body count of Bravo 2 Zero was zero. <laughs> The real problem with exaggerating or gilding the lily or whatever you want to call it is that when you're writing about war, it has consequences, dangerous consequences. It creates unrealistic expectations of what real soldiers fighting real wars are actually capable of. Chris Ryan walked for 200 kilometers over seven nights until he crossed the border with Syria. And Michael Asher is still doggedly in his footsteps. One thing left is Ryan's journey, which I think was a magnificent feat. Although, in view of the fact that he's exaggerated so much in his book, my desire to do the journey, to follow in his footsteps, has really diminished. Michael Asher reaches the review Euphrates. Chris Ryan had another four days walking ahead of him. But Michael Asher decides he's had enough of following in the footsteps of Bravo 2-0. I don't really feel the need to do this heroic journey anymore simply because I don't think it really was heroic. I think it's really despicable that McNabb and Ryan are hiding behind pseudonyms saying that their real names are a security threat when they've gone against the regimental tradition and named the three dead men and after all their families are equally vulnerable. I always thought that uh, Ryan was wrong to name Vince uh, which is not in the tradition of the regiment um, at the same time you know sort of hiding himself behind a pseudonym uh, I think it's sort of like Batman and Robin you know they want to uh, you know give themselves secret identities it just adds to the mystique there's one last job to do now, I've got something very special here it's a can of Guinness and uh, this was Vince Phillips favorite drink I brought this all the way from England to bury in this spot. I'm going to bury it in memory of Vince Phillips, Sergeant Vince Phillips of the 22nd Special Air Service Regiment, who died on this spot. And, you know, I hope his memory will always be honoured. Uh, you know, I, I think he was really, you know, an asset to, to the regiment. And uh, I'm going to bury it in the ground, and then we're going to build a cairn of stones over it. Okay, we can show you the Hajar. While some other members of the patrol were given medals, Vince Phillips was not, a decision which has offended many. 
I think he ought to have got a medal myself. You know, if I was giving out the medals, I'd have given one to Vince Phillips. I think he was just as much deserving of a medal as any other member of the patrol. After all, he gave his life. And what more can you give? We want to forget that they, the Iraqi people are human beings, people like us, people who love their children, you know, people who are just ordinary like we are, you know, and turn them into these sort of, uh, you know, robots who can be knocked down, you know, as if it's a game. You know, 250 people just like that. Well, you know, they didn't kill 250 people. Back in England, Michael fulfills his promise to the Phillips family. He tells them what he's discovered and returns Vince's binoculars. I think that people serving in the SAS regiment now and those who've served in it in the past are going to be quite disturbed by what I've discovered on my trip. So I would Peter Ratcliffe was the SAS regimental sergeant major at the time of the Gulf War. He debriefed the Bravo 2-0 survivors when they got back. He's very critical of McNabb and Ryan as he found large gaps between what they said at the debrief and what they then claimed in their books. Well, the sad thing is about Ryan is that his, so his story is fantastic in its own right. And to have it embellished like that, actually, um, has got a sour taste yeah. in, in lots of people's mouths, basically. Right. So, I mean, you, would you say that other members of the regiment feel the way you feel about um, Ryan's book or, or McNabb's book um, and the claims they've made? I think the guys, most guys feel that... Um, these claims are just absolutely ridiculous. 